Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Amir Karam, board certified facial plastic surgeon and founder and creator of KaramMD Skin. I specialize in facial rejuvenation, which basically means I help people look as young as they feel. And on today's episode of Skin School, we're gonna talk about melasma. And melasma, as you know, is a very common, very popular topic that is affecting many people, both men and women, and it has a lot of misconceptions and lack of clarity in terms of both what it is the underlying reasons it exists, but also the ideal treatment. And I'm gonna share this with you, that my wife has been suffering from melasma for the last 15, 16 years, starting in her mid 30s and we have literally gone through every type of treatment you can think of to get her melasma under control and I have learned so much not just from her experiences but also from the experience of the countless number of patients we've tried to help along the way who also suffer from melasma and I've learned a ton so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about basically the conventional wisdom, understanding about what melasma is, what type of treatments are available, and then I'm gonna talk to you at the very end of this all about what I have learned and what I consider to be the optimal or ideal way of treating melasma, period. All right, so let's break it down. So what is melasma? Melasma is a skin condition where you get patches of darkened, either brownish, gray, brown, you know, hyperpigmentation patches basically throughout the skin. It can affect the forehead area, it can affect the cheeks. It's very common across the uh, upper lip, giving the appearance of almost like a mustache. It can be literally anywhere in the face. And it can affect people of any age and any skin type, but Ultimately, what are the causes of it? The most common reason why melasma is thought to occur is because of hormonal changes. Now this could be because of hormonal changes that exist in the body. Perimenopause, menopause is known to exacerbate or cause melasma. It could also be because of external hormones that you're taking like birth control pills or hormone replacement therapy. Very, very common to see this with people who are on birth control pills as well because you know they're often a lot younger and they uh, carry on and start to form. This was the reason why my wife's melasma was originated from. We think it's from the birth control pills that she started taking after she was done with her pregnancies. Additional reasons why you can have melasma, there could be a genetic component. Some people just have it in their genes and you see it in multiple members of the family. There's also the underlying source of sunlight. UV light is not only a cause of melasma, but it can also be an exacerbator of it, which I want you to really pay attention to as we get into the next segment of this, which is related to treatment. So sunlight is absolutely a critical and important part of the story, and I want you to hang on to that as we discuss other parts of the treatment uh, programs. Believe it or not, even products and certain things that agitate or aggravate the skin can cause and exacerbate melasma. So for example, people who get regular chemical peels or use an abrasive cleanser or microdermabrasion on a regular basis and their skin is inflamed, a lot of times you can see melasma either being caused or being exacerbated by these practices. Finally, even medical conditions that are totally unrelated to your skin, things like thyroid disease have been shown to relate to melasma, and maybe that's part of the hormonal story that we just mentioned, but people who have underlying thyroid conditions can see melasma on their skin as well. A couple other things that can exacerbate melasma, in addition to the ones we just talked about, are things like stress. I mean, stress is related to just about every type of medical condition. Why wouldn't it be related to melasma? Well, it shows that it is. So stress can be an exacerbator of melasma as well. And then there's also certain medications in addition to the hormone um, pills that we talked about. Things like NSAIDs, things like Advil, ibuprofen, those type of things have also been shown to exacerbate the presence of melasma. I'm not sure if those things cause melasma per se, but they certainly have been shown to have an impact in terms of making melasma worse. All right, so when we think about melasma, and we just went through some of the things that can either cause it or exacerbate it, at the cellular level, what is actually happening? 
So we have cells in our skin called melanocytes. And for whatever reason that we just mentioned, these cells go into overdrive and they start to produce pigment. And the pigment that they produce is melanin. And that melanin starts to move up from the basal cells of the skin, the layer of the deep dermis, and they start to float higher and higher up into the skin. And then they start to rest in the epidermis and upper dermis. So you start to see islands of pigmentation, not completely different than the story that we get from sun damage leading to hyperpigmentation. But the difference here is that it's a little bit more patchy and a little bit more coalesced where with typical sun damage it's usually in dots throughout the face here you're seeing more or less like an, a larger island of pigmentation forming like on an entire cheek or a patch across the forehead or as I mentioned around this area so the underlying reason comes down to the melanocyte the melanocyte is the culprit it is the producer of melanin and melanin is the reason why we have pigment in our skin right so Understanding that, it gives us a, an insight into what type of things would actually be effective in terms of controlling that process. Now keep in mind that when we tan, what we're doing is we're elevating the mel melanin in our skin and we get darkening as a result of that. Now that's a favorable response that we get when we want that golden, you know, sun-kissed looking tan. But at the end of the day, it's the same mechanism, right? So this is why I want you to continuously remember sun and its impact on mel melanin and melanocytes. And we're gonna continuously kind of remind ourselves that that is a very important mechanism and then we're gonna come back to it at the very end to talk about that really specifically. All right, so you have heard probably lots of different types of treatments associated with controlling or improving melasma. You probably also heard of many things that can actually worsen melasma in the realm of treatment. So let's kind of tackle that topic for a second. So the basic tools that we use in skin treatment typically are lasers and chemical peels and microneedling, right? Those are the things that we all know and think about. Now, what's the logic of using a laser? So as I said, this melanin is born in the melanocytes and creeps up into the upper layers of the skin, the, the upper layer of the dermis. And when you use a laser or you use a chemical peel, what you're trying to do is you're trying to remove any portion of the skin that houses those melanin particles in the surface. So the idea is to kind of go through and wipe off some of that stuff. Now, there's certain lasers that can help in that regard, and then there's certain lasers that can actually hurt it. Generally speaking, if you're just taking off the, the top layers where the melanin exists, you're actually not doing anything to the process of melanin production or melanin you know, migration. So even if to some degree the pigments are being broken up by the laser, let's say hypothetically you're using intense pulse light which targets brown pigment. In certain settings, you can temporarily improve the pigment by effectively evaporating those melanin particles and making it better but you're not treating the source. Same thing goes with chemical peels. You're removing pigment harboring skin as you're peeling off those upper layers with the chemical peel, but at the bottom line is stuff is still coming up from below. So there's been, you know, this type of logic that, you know, repetitive laser treatments can, can do this. Now the problem is for anyone who's gone through chemical peels or lasers, it's an investment, not just in terms of money, which they typically tend to be on the more expensive side, but they also have downtime. So you're going through this process of downtime, which isn't ideal, obviously. There's another part of it. Certain types of inflammatory processes, like a laser, like a chemical peel, especially if they're prolonged, can increase and stimulate the melanocyte in terms of forming melanin and actually make the condition of melasma worse. We see this, unfortunately, when people undergo a, a big laser treatment and they're, they're red for a few weeks, the melasma comes back and it's 10 times worse. Now, let me say this. I've made that mistake. I've made that mistake because I look at a person and I think to myself, you know, I'm being mindful of this. I'm not, you know, being ignorant of the, of the reality that this person could have, but I'm making a judgment call. I look at them and I see what appears to be sun damage. Well, sun damage and lasers are a perfect marriage but it turns out that it's melasma. Then you go through your deep laser resurfacing like you would normally, next thing you know, boom, the melasma is 
on fire. It looks way worse than it did before. And then you kick yourself and say, whoa, how did I miss that? Well, you missed it innocently because it's very difficult, even with you know, different types of diagnostic tools, it's sometimes difficult to make that call. And I'm gonna to talk to you about what I've learned from that in a, in a moment here. So chemical peel, same thing. It can exacerbate it, especially if it's a more medium depth chemical peel, as opposed to a light one, which doesn't create much inflammation. So anything that is going to inflame the tissues of the skin, that normally would be good because once the once the inflammation goes away, things look better, can exacerbate. Now the the workaround here, and I want you to just to keep this in mind, because if you're if you're in the situation where you have some of this and you're gonna go through some type of laser or chemical peel, it is absolutely best to pre-treat your skin with either hydroquinone for six to eight weeks before or hydroquinone and retinol six to eight weeks before. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna suppress the mel melanin producing cells temporarily to allow you to heal from the laser or the chemical peel without having that. So pre-treatment is extremely important, especially if you have anything that resembles melasma, but even if you're of the darker skin type, right? So if you have olive skin and you could you know, increase your melanin production, you could definitely hyperpigment. Uh, Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is very common. That's not the same as, as melasma, but it can certainly exacerbate melasma. All right, so on the topic of treatment, let's think about anything you can do aside from using lasers and chemical peels. So that you, as I just mentioned, I'm gonna summarize this in a moment, not a big fan of those treatments because they're only treating the top surface, possibly removing a little bit, but they're not getting to the core. Now, what is gonna to get to the core? Number one, sun protection. You gotta diminish the stimulation of those melanocytes from forming melanin. So sun protection in the way of UV protection sunblock, like zinc or titanium-based mineral sunscreens, wearing hats, wearing visors, wearing face masks, those are all extremely important ways to limit the amount of sun stimulation that's gonna happen. There's other things that you do topically to suppress melanin production. Probably the most common one that you've heard about is hydroquinone. Hydroquinone is a prescription level skin lightener that basically suppresses the production of melanin at the level of the melanocytes. Problem is that you can't stay on hydroquinone for too long. The upper limit, generally speaking, is about six months because there's a condition that can actually cause rebound hyperpigmentation when you get off of hydroquinone. And it's not great to be on it for a long time because there's been some studies that have been shown that it can affect you know, skin cancers and other type of toxicities. So especially at levels of, of 8% and above, and you know, most, most prescriptions in the US tend to be around 4%. So it's a, the verdict is a little bit more unclear about that, but nevertheless, you're playing with a little bit of fire if you're staying on it for a really long time. Plus, you, know, you just don't want to get that stuff into you you know, that has any potential to have some negative effects on your skin for too long. But in the short run, it can certainly help bring some of that pigment down and improve the discoloration. But what do you do if you get past that point and you wanna continue this process? Because like I said, the minute you get off of it, your melanin is gonna to start to secrete again, and then bam, you're back to, to baseline. Here's what happens. There are non-hydroquinone categories of lighteners. Those are things like retinols, vitamin C, there's a whole category of plant-based non-hydroquinone lighteners. There's azelaic acid that can suppress the melanocytes, and all these work in different ways of diminishing the amount of melanin that's produced. Now I'm gonna say this. Those are things that you can stay on forever, right? They are dual purpose, meaning that they're gonna suppress melanin, but they're also stimulating collagen, specifically you know, retinols and vitamin C. So those are great anti-aging components. Generally speaking, Keep that in mind, I want, I'll summarize this all at the end, but you want to stay on those products and you wanna stay on them for good because they can have impact on a long-term basis. That's huge. There are other medications that have been talked about, which is like TXA, which is transazemic acid. Those type of things, they have benefits in terms of suppression of the melanin producing and improve melasma, but the downside is that they can increase the risk of blood clots. Now, if you're on a birth control pill, for example, and you, happen to hear about TXA and you don't tell your doctor that you're on birth control and you take TXA, at the same time you're increased risk of blood clots and different things like that, which is a big, big mistake to do that. So anything that has like a, a risk associated with that, I'm a little bit weary. Again, I'm not a big fan of taking things like TXA in the long run. It's okay for initial suppression, try to get things a little bit under control if you have really severe melasma, but I'm not a big fan of it as being a long-term. So TXA is another one of those kind of things like hydroquinone, which can have immediate impact 
and help with you over you know, the course of a six month period or three to six months period, but I wouldn't stay on it. Now, if you are on hormone therapy and birth control, you have a choice to make. You know these are the things that stimulate the melasma in the first place, but if it's important to you to be on those hormones, then you have to learn ways to suppress things. And that's where you know the treatments like the retinols, vitamin C, different plant-based non-hydroquinone lighteners and things like that all work together to control the situation despite being on something that's stimulating it. So those are all really important. Now, if you really wanna to get to the bottom of it, you can obviously get off of those hormone treatments or treat the underlying cause if you have like thyroid disease or some other thing, but you can do that. Now that's a choice you're gonna to have to make. In the case of my wife, she wanted to stay on the birth control pill. She didn't wanna get off of it for a lot of different reasons. And as a result of it, she's chosen to control the melasma. And like I said earlier, we've learned really good ways of controlling it. I'm gonna talk about that in summary in a minute. There's this concept of combination therapy. The combination therapy means that you're, you're doing the topical agents that we just talked about. You're also using certain lasers like IPLs or fractionated lasers to break up the, the pods of, of pigment. Again, pros and cons. Medicine I'm all in favor for. Use of those type of treatments, not a big fan of. And here's why. I'm gonna tell you a little story. We had a very close friend of ours that had very severe melasma very severe. I mean, it was just like dark patches everywhere. So kind of made it my, my personal pet project to really get after this. So what we did, we put her on hydroquinone, we put her on retinol, we put her on all these like really, really powerful topical agents to suppress them on. Then we started doing a series of chemical peels, that are impacting the, the surface melanin. We use profractional therapy, which is an erbium YAG laser that breaks up the pigment, did all these things. After a year of consistent, very consistent, hardcore treatment, her melasma looked incredible. I mean, she was like very, very mild. I'm talking go from severe to mild. And I thought, man, we, we really cracked this nut. We've got this thing figured out. But guess what? <laughs> she goes on a weekend takes her son to an amusement park here in, in Southern California, goes to the amusement park, spends the entire weekend out in the sun, doesn't take the sun precautions, and she comes back on Monday, we're back to square one. Dark, bright, hardcore melasma, as if we didn't do one thing for the entire year. How frustrating is that? How unbelievably challenging, and people go through this all the time. And this is what's going to lead me to tell you all these experiences have led me to a simple series of conclusions that I think will help you. What I learned there is that no matter what you do, if you take your eye off the ball when it comes to sun protection, you are getting nowhere with this. No matter how much money you spend and no matter how consistent you are, melasma is powerful and it's incredibly sensitive to sunlight. So here's my recommendations after all these years, both, both in terms of what we've done for my wife, which is literally everything that I just mentioned, you know, every type of BBL, every type of laser treatment, chemical peel, all the topicals, all the intense hydroquinone, all that stuff we've tried. Her melasma has literally never looked better and here's why. So several years ago, a good friend of ours had a, a vertical restore with me and, and a laser treatment. And my wife and her loved to go out and walk and enjoy the Southern California you know, hills and all this stuff. And normally they're very good with, with a wide brim hat and sunscreen and all that kind of stuff. But there's always a baseline melasma that, that is underlying on her face, a little bit around her lips and a little bit around her forehead here and there. What she was doing at the time was using sun protection when the, the way of sunscreen. She was also using on and off of hydroquinone, like cycles of hydroquinone, three months off, three months on, etc. But the melasma was always there. Then her friend gets this procedure done, and you know, to my chagrin, she's out in the sun after a full field laser resurfacing. This is her friend, and so I told her, you know what, you can't do that. So she goes off and finds a UV protective mask. Cooley Bar makes this. And it's basically just literally like a mask that comes across here, it drops down into the neck and the decollete area. And then, so she starts wearing it. Well, my wife sees this and she's always been really hardcore about sun protection to the best that she was aware of and adds this as a second layer of her sun protective lifestyle. So now wide burn hat, facial mask and sunscreen underneath. Off they go. Now, at around the same time, 
I developed the trifecta, which is a combination of 21 different active ingredients, but it has retinol, it has vitamin C, it has botanical lighteners, and also in our product polish, we have azelaic acid. She's taking all this at the same time. She's being extremely mindful of, of the, uh, the sun protection as she always has, but with this next, next level with the mask. And then a year goes by and it's like her melasma is lighter and lighter. Now it's roughly three years. We haven't done a single treatment in that period of time. We just stopped all those lasers and things like that. We've stopped everything. Other than microneedling for collagen stimulation, et cetera, which is a short downtime. She's using that in addition to her trifecta, she uses a topical full strength retinol as well. Even though there's retinol in the trifecta, she's always used a higher, a higher dose of it, so she continues on that. So with the observation that I've, I've made with this is that the answer is not in the treatments. That, I mean, it's just like waxing and waning melasma when you're doing that. The answer is in hardcore sun protection and the use of melanin suppression, which comes from the topicals that are used. Now, it just so happens, and I didn't develop trifecta for control of melanin, but now that I kind of started hearing from patients and I started hearing this very early on that their pigments were starting to improve, it makes sense because of what is actually in it that remember I said, I mean, this was developed for anti-aging, but it also has components that are important for melanin suppression at, you know, they're kind of a double-edged sword in that way. So it makes sense and the consistency of the use of it has led a lot of people to see improvements in their uh, melasma. You don't have to use the trifecta. You can go get, you know, all these different components in separate pieces. It just makes it easier with trifecta to do it consistently, but don't even bother doing these things unless you're gonna be hardcore with the sun protection aspect. So again, strongly recommend sun protective lifestyle, even on your hands, believe it or not. There have been studies that showed even sunlight on different parts of your body can stimulate facial melasma. That's how sensitive it is. So take this seriously, take this through almost 15, 20 years of, of clinical experience dealing with patients. Little bit of luck that came along the way to kind of show us the way a little bit, but when you pay attention to cause and effect and you start to understand the physiology of things, it all makes sense. So that is the fundamentals of understanding the sources of melasma, the underlying reasons why it happens, the you know biology of it, standard treatment, and then what I consider to be the optimal treatment. And that is, Get rid of all the physical treatments like lasers and chemical peels. Those are too temporary. I wouldn't get on TXA and things like that unless you want to kind of take a jump start on it. Hydroquinone, same thing. If you want to jump start, no problem with that. But at some point, you got to stop that. And once you stop that, you want to carry on for the rest of your life because melasma is, generally speaking, not going to go away. That's the other thing is if it's hormonal based or genetic based, it's not going away. So you got to have a long-term plan with this. And this is the best long-term plan that I can think of at this point. All right, folks, I hope that gave you some really good insight, some understanding of the cause and effects and, uh, and put you on a good path. This is such a common, common topic, one that I've actually been wanting to speak to you guys about for a very long time, and I'm happy to finally do this. And I want you to share it with any friends and family that you have that might be suffering from melasma and wondering what to do. Um, share it with your, your physicians as well, dermatologists as well, um, and get their, their opinions on it. Um, but this is what's been working for us. And once again, thank you so much. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Lots of good information, both in terms of skin school, as well as general topics of facial rejuvenation, both surgical and non-surgical. And uh, like it, comment below if you have any questions or you wanna just give me some feedback about what I, what I said here. If you've experienced some issues with melasma, love to hear your stories, um, both good and bad. And ultimately, uh, until the next time, Dr. Amir Karam, thanks so much.